Good afternoon, everyone. Did you have a good lunch? All right. Is everybody exhausted now after lunch? Ready for this whole workbook? Yeah. It's going to be a great seminar. Have to move this up a little. So my name is Carrie Kalsher. I am the director of sales and education at Rex Hill Winery and A to Z Wineworks. I see a lot of people I know. Welcome. Good to see you again. Uh, I am happy to welcome you to Measuring and Maximizing Your Wine Club and Events. We're pleased to have the Wise Academy with us today. Uh, did anybody see their presentation last year? Yes. Got a lot of repeat business here. So you know how valuable that was for all of us being able to focus on tasting room. Uh, so this year we're going to focus a little bit more on wine club. Uh, the importance of a healthy and growing and thriving wine club to a direct sales program cannot be overstated. These are your loyalists. These are your people that are going to give you a, a guaranteed revenue quarterly, at least twice a year. These are the people that are going to respond to your e-commerce most readily. So maintaining that in an increasingly competitive market is huge. When, uh, just to give you some personal experience, when Rex Hill was founded in 1982, there were about a dozen wineries in the Willamette Valley. In 2010, when I started at Rex Hill, there were 419 wineries in Oregon. It's pretty impressive growth. Even more impressive is that in the last seven years of my tenure there at Rex Hill, that has grown by another 67%. There are now over 700 wineries in Oregon. So when we talk about increasingly competitive, yes, we're a collaborative industry, but how do you separate yourself from the great Pinot being made down the street, especially when consumers are looking for variety? How do you get them to stay in your wine club? And further, how do you convert new people that are walking into your tasting room into joining that wine club? How many of you run your direct sales programs at your wineries? Raise your hand. And of those, how many of you track your conversion rates for your wine club? Pretty good? Pretty good? Measuring what matters is the first step in knowing where those, op those opportunities lie. So I'm pleased to welcome Leslie Berglund and her team today, Wise Academy. Uh, Leslie is going to take us through these measurements, show us where those opportunities lie, and further give us some actionable items to take back to our wineries with us. So without further ado, please welcome the Wise Academy. Thank you, Carrie. Let's chat about wine club motivations. Why members join, why members stay. Wouldn't it be great if we could actually see into the mind of our consumers? This cartoon attempts that. I just don't see our brand of pickle relish anywhere in here. Inconceivable. This is a brand loyalist. This afternoon, we're going to explore the motivations of our prospects, of our club members, and of our team. And we're going to share some of the best practices, as well as some out-of-the-box thinking when it comes to successfully growing our wine clubs. To set the stage together, we'll all do a hands-on exercise, similar to last year's, but on wine club instead of tasting room, that helps bring these ideas to life. It is my privilege to be back here again. <clears throat> and this is always one of our favorite weeks of the year. Good, good excuse to come out and visit a lot of wineries up in the Willamette Valley. Send a lot of Pinot Noir and Rosé home ahead of me, which is awesome. So up here on stage with me, again, my name is Leslie Berglund, and I have two WISE team members up here, Sonia Grepsky and Liz Mercer. And together we have over 50 years of combined experience in developing, managing, and growing wine clubs. Over the past, past two decades, these two ladies alone have directly managed 29 separate clubs, serving a combined total of 80,000 club members. I'm going to have them each introduce them, give a little bit of background for them, and then we'll get going. So, Sonia. Hi, my name is Sonia Grabsky, and uh, I really started my venture in the wine club world actually working with Leslie Berglund at Ambrosia where we didn't have a brick and mortar. And after she sold to 1-800-Flowers, I decided to go uh, back into kind of a winery where I could 
going to get more interaction with customers. So I went to Domain Carneros and had, at our high point, a 9,000-person wine club. I then uh, went to Terlato and ran five different brands for them. And then um, I was wooed to Constellation, you know that tiny little place. Mm -hmm. And I ran about 11 brands there, uh, running a $36 million a year DTC business. Uh, so it's safe to say that I'm incredibly passionate about Wine Club, uh, very excited about direct to consumer. In fact, I'd love to just say this morning was so great to see all this morning's speakers talk about how DTC is so important and how you can use that to shift things in your channels. And so I'm really excited how we can help you do that. Um, most recently, I am the VP of Sales and Marketing for Cornerstone Sellers, and I also have some consulting projects. I specialize now in kind of turnarounds and startups. Great. Thank you. Liz. Good afternoon. My name is Liz Mercer, and I'm a 17-year veteran of the wine industry, exclusively in direct-to-consumer. I made a choice to go and to be a part of direct-to-consumer. I've been thrilled to watch the evolution of what has happened in direct-to-consumer over the last 17 years. I have spent my career in wineries. I started with Seagram at the time in Sterling Vineyards. I managed Mum Napa right across the valley from Sonia, we were having dinner together once a month, and the best thing was we couldn't talk business because I was also a sparkling wine house, except I had 11,000 wine club members. <laughs> <laughs> it, to, now I am managing uh, the general manager of a small urban winery in San Francisco, uh, and it's phenomenal to continue to be on the floor, engaging with guests, and really understanding what's happening in the direct-to-consumer movement and how strong that can build a brand. I'm thrilled to be part of the Wise Academy. Leslie uh, invited Sonia and I to be a part of the Wise Academy as it was developing, and so we've been with it from its inception as instructors, content contributors, and on panels like this. And so we're excited to be here today. Great, thank you. One of the things I'm personally passionate about and that we are at Wise, our whole reason for being is to help develop the next generation of leadership in this industry. And so before we started WISE eight years ago now, at the time, there wasn't any general managers or presidents that we knew of that came up through the ranks of the consumer direct channel. But yet, the majority of the gross margin and profitability of most, all small wineries and most medium wineries come from that channel. So that's really what we're all about. We have certification classes, we have mystery shopping, we have lots of stuff. Hope you come visit the booth, end of commercial. Okay, <laughs> let's chat. <clears throat> a little bit more about what we're going to do today. So first, we're going to take a look at the Re Oregon's Regional Wine Club metrics, both from some industry survey results from the Silicon Valley Bank survey that Rob McMillan was mentioning this morning, as well as some of our own mystery shopping results. We're going to see how they stack up against other we regions and also compare to some trends that we see with our own wise wineries. Second, yes, you have highlighters in front of you and a workbook in front of you, we're going to do a hands-on case study where we analyze a sample winery. This is a fictitious winery, Leslie's Winery. And for those of you who have worked with WISE, Leslie's Winery is always getting in trouble. We're going to take a look at that and see what's going on with the club. We're doing that to really bring the numbers to life. And then finally, we're going to brainstorm what are some things that we could do? What are some out-of-the-box ideas that we can do to dramatically improve wine club metrics and really drive the business? It's my hope that by the time we leave here, and there was a typo in the program, this session does end at 5 p.m., not 4.45. Um, by the time we leave here at 5 p.m., I hope you have a couple new ideas, some ahas, some key takeaways that you're thinking about that you weren't thinking of a few moments ago when you walked in the, in the, um, into this room. In your workbook in Section 6, there are areas for your ahas, and we encourage you to write them down. <coughs> Rather than go through a whole bunch of slides, I spent some time over the last couple of days digging into the detailed data of the Wine Business Monthly and Silicon Valley Bank survey from last year and pulled out a couple areas that I think are most relevant for our discussion today. 
And so first of all, we heard this morning that general table wine sales are growing like 2%. Well, you know, there's an aspect of this business, and yes, Oregon is growing faster than that, but there's an aspect of this business that's really growing fast, and that's the wine clubs. Across in both uh, southern and northern Oregon, our clubs have been growing at 13%. That's slightly behind U.S. average of 14 this is great news because the strong foundation of all of our direct-to-consumer businesses is going to keep growing and growing and growing. The good, uh, even better news is when we get members to join us, that annual revenue per member is extremely high. Southern Oregon, it's 512. Northern, it's 725. That mostly has to do with the price point differentiation between the two. So when we sign up our wine club members and think about, yes, we give them some discounts or member savings is a preferred term I like to use. And yes, we pay our team commission to, bring, to, to land those wine club members. We're getting $500 to $700 a year in revenue on an ongoing basis. So that's a worthwhile investment. Also something to be extremely proud of here in Oregon is our membership tenure. About 24 months in southern Oregon and 27 months in northern Oregon. Those are really, really healthy because you guys have a very low attrition rate vis-a-vis -vis some other regions. Our member savings is about 17, 18%, which is super. And all of, those, all of these things we've talked about so far is kind of in alignment and in really good shape vis-a-vis -vis other regions across the country with one exception, <laughs> and actually two exceptions. The first one of which is what we're paying in staff commission. So if we think about this, <clears throat> is the members are so profitable that we don't mind paying the commission and the, and, the, and the member savings. But if we look at this, in Southern Oregon, on average, we're paying about $11 for, for, to our team members to get a new member. And that goes up to, let me see, $23 in Northern. That, as if you go and you do the math and you say, okay, what's our annual revenue per club member average times their tenure, how long they stay, that is our lifetime value of those club members, which in Southern Oregon is do, 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 about 1,024, and in Northern is $1,632, and we're paying $11 in Southern and 23 in Northern. That's about 1% of the lifetime value, or lifetime value of the customer. And if you look across the regions, there are other regions, and I actually, for those of you who work with me, you know I, I try not to bring up the Napa difference because I know it's really, really different than what's here. But in this case, I actually do want to put out this example. In Napa, and they're growing at 17%, okay, they are the, the largest installed wine club member base, meaning wine clubs have been around for a long, long time, and they're growing still today at the fastest rate in the country. And the difference, one of the differences may be they pay about 2%, 2.1% actually. It doesn't sound like a lot, but let's think about it. If you actually, for your team members, and I know Rob McMillan brought up this morning that labor is a huge issue, a huge struggle to attract people into these jobs. It tends to be kind of like a revolving door in our tasting rooms is um, if we were paying at that 2.1%, it would actually translate to, if you, one of your team members was selling on average just one club membership a day, that's an extra three to four dollars on their hourly rate. That's material. And I remember back in the day in Napa when we didn't, I mean, nobody paid for wine club memberships. It was about 20, 25 years ago. And guess what? There weren't that many wine club members. And then we started to pay commission, and guess what? We started getting more wine club members. And then about 10 years ago, we started paying <clears throat> scaled commission, meaning if you've got a $3 club, it's $10. If you've got a uh, $3, three bottle club, it's $10. A six-bottle club, you pay $20. If it's a case club, you pay $40. And guess what? We started selling more six-pack and 12-pack clubs. And so I just offer this up as saying, I know we're all struggling with labor. We're st struggling to keep uh, the good people in place. 
It's 1% additional of the sales of this lifetime value of the member. So just something for your consideration. A next point that I wanted to bring up is our annual attrition rate here in Oregon is, is actually really low. It's about 16%, uh, national average is 18%, so that's, that's huge. Just to remind you how we calculate attrition is you take, during a period of time, the number of members that we lost during that period of time, month, quarter, year, divided by the starting membership number. Okay, so 16, 18%, that's really healthy. I know plenty of wine clubs that can actually function with a 20 to 24% attrition rate, and that's fine too, so you guys are doing super there. The biggest challenge, though, that we have, I think, in this region, is that our conversion rate, meaning out of the people who are coming into the tasting room who are not already currently wine club members, we're only converting 4% of them. Now, granted, the rest of the country is also at 4%, but that's because we have a lot of regions that are like one and two, okay? Because there are other regions, and there certainly are individual wineries who convert much higher than that. There's a couple things going on with this. One is, I mean, there's really kind of three key levers when we have a low conversion rate. First one is, do we have the right level of staff when it gets busy, can we really, can we really sh um, give the right level of attention to our guests to be able to give them a great brand experience and sell them memberships? Second is, is our staff effectively focused on wine club memberships? You know, are, do they have the right incentive compensation such that it makes a difference to their paycheck? They get it. Are they confident in their sales skills in, do, in doing it? Are they trained? And so that's the second, is this, that, staff, uh, that staff focus. And the third area, and this is the last two points in the slide here, we also find that it has a lot to do with the guest experience design. Tasting bars, belly up to the bar, gets crazy on weekends, that conversion rate's gonna be lower, you know, like 3%. Whereas I'm seeing more and more of you starting to do some seated experiences you know, seated private or at least with table service, something like that, actually your conversion rates will go up dramatically nationally. That difference between 3.4% for tasting bar versus 11.4% for, for a seated tasting. That's material. And so my encouragement with you guys is, is a couple things. One is, if you have different types of experiences, do you measure the impact separately, because it's once you do that, you'll start saying, oh, wow, there are better ways to do this. So that's all food for thought. So this tells us a little bit regionally and nationally what's going on with wine clubs. We, as <laughs> some of you guys know, we always um, boondoggle somewhat, come up a couple days in advance and go visit as many uh, local tasting rooms and wineries as we can. And so what we'll do is we'll share with you a little bit of the why. If this is the what's happening from a club standpoint, some mystery shopping <coughs> gives us some insight into why it may be happen happening. Great. So a couple things. We visited uh, 10 wineries over the last couple days. Actually, we visited more than that, but some of you recognized us as we're getting to know and know you better, so can't count that. Um, so 10 clean shops, if you will. And so it, really good news. I mean, in general, first of all, high customer satisfaction. You have great wines, fabulous wineries, a good time, and a, as I mentioned before, cases and cases of wine will beat us home. Something, the first time I did a round of shops up here was in at the end of 2012. And less than 20% of the time did anyone ask me to buy wine. Okay, you guys have moved the needle substantially. Now, it's only 10 wineries that is not statistically significant. It's at least directionally interesting, but let's go with it. 90% of the time, nine out of 10 times, we were asked if we wanted to buy wine. These ladies were happy because last year I wouldn't let them buy wine unless we were asked. So that worked out True really story. well. We brought a lot of wine home this trip, so thank you. 
And if there's FedEx reps in the room, thank you. <laughs> yes. And so the other thing that we really want to say is we saw some phenomenal examples of what we call service heart. So team members who really went above and beyond the call to exceed our expectations. And so these are, these are awesome, awesome progress. Now, this is a workshop focused around what can we do to move the needle. And so we also called out a couple areas that I hope, when we're here again, hopefully next year, we'll see the, we'll see the needle move. In only four out of the 10, time, 10 shops did we hear any type of brand story at all. The majority of the conversation was about the descriptions of the wines or the vineyards, but not some of that compelling brand story. And so I know there's a session tomorrow on bringing your brand alive in the tasting room, and I'm going to go. I hope you guys do too. Second thing is, not necessarily with the same wineries, in only four out of ten times did we see any wine club materials at all. Like not on the counter, not on the table, not there. And so, wow, we're set, if, that's, if that is representative, or if you think, oh, it's always out on the bar all the time, it's like, actually go and see, is it really? The other, and the next thing is only three out of ten times were, did, did the host notice our buying signals. And if we had a video of this, you guys would be embarrassed how blatant we are with buying signals, verbal and nonverbal, stroking the club brochure, making smiley faces on the, on the tasting notes. And so we're missing some of those signs. And because they can be, you know, just easy kind of shooting fish in a barrel to sell someone something. The next couple areas are the ones that are the, this is the biggest bang for the buck. We have lots of great things, we as an industry, to say about our wines, and we're spending all the time talking about the what's about our wines. We're stuck in monologue mode. It is often very entertaining. It is great presentations, but we're not, I mean, zero percent of the time did we get any, any questions beyond where are you from? or have you been here? But we're not getting those open-ended questions to get to know the guest that's in front of you, to figure out what brought them in today, to figure out what, the, what might be their connection with our wine club. It's hard to sell the club in a relevant way because you have so many fabulous benefits about your club if you don't know who's in front of you. So again, in these 10 samples, we, we were stuck in monologue and not figuring out who's in front of us. Um, and then, this is the part, 90% of the time we were asking if we wanted to buy wine. Great, awesome. Zero, zero, zip, nada, nothing. Didn't get one person to ask us about the club, nor contact data capture. Okay, so in this case, you know, you guys are obviously selling clubs, so this is not, a, you know, I don't know if it's a representative sampling or not, but I do know that we're missing 100% of the shots that we're not taking, okay? And so in that way, these, as we mentioned, Sonia and Liz are very experienced in stepping in and growing clubs, and you've probably encountered situations like this. If you had team members that, for whatever reason, weren't, weren't putting out the club materials, weren't bringing out the club, what do you do to, to fix that? Yeah, so I think the first thing that I do is make sure that it's accessible. So is the, the club information there? Is it not tucked away in a closet that staff can't get to when they run out of? Uh, and I make sure that they're comfortable with the club. Do they understand it? Is the staff, are they, are they even members themselves? Do they see the value in it? Do they see the benefit to it? That's where I really start and making sure that as a manager, I'm doing my job to make sure that I've got my staff excited about the wine club. They know what the next release is. They know when it's happening. They know what the benefits are. I think that's where I feel So would you have your team members be members of your club? Oh, would that, that be part of their employment? They are a club member? As an incentive, as a, as a benefit, absolutely. So they get the experience of opening the box just like a club member does. Cool. Uh, I think one thing, you know, I try to really build out, kind of choreograph things for my team so that they've got these little sales seeds that they can drop, starting with the, hi, welcome to the winery, are you a club member? Just put that out there to begin. We have a club, silently, making sure that there's silent selling tools out and available, that price lists have wine club prices. 
that if you're showing wines, it, you know, oh, this is a wine club member only wine, or this was featured in this month's wine club shipment. And I think wine club member only wines is a great tool to get people to join your club. And I think it circles back to this morning when we we're talking about channel mix and looking at certain wines going, maybe this isn't right to have in the three tier market, but we have these grapes we're making and we're passionate about it. We can tell a story about it. Well, let's put it in the club. Let's treat people that way and get those wines out in a different way. All right. Did you have any other ideas on this? Yeah, you know, really, for me, it's about extending an invitation. And, you know, we, we often have an internal conversation at WISE where we are the only industry in the world where people pay us money to experience our products when you think about it. So if you have somebody who's walking into your tasting room. They've already pre-qualified themselves that, hey, I like wine or I have an interest in wine or teach me about wine. Then they hand you 15 bucks, 20 bucks, and say, tell me about you. Nobody else does that. I think any other marketer would kill to have that type of interaction with a consumer. And so I feel that it, the next logical step is to invite them to be a part of our family and just to keep that relationship and that conversation going. And it's just a progression. And when you break it down like that and you, you explain that to your team and, and, and engage them in that process of how do we invite people to keep that relationship going, you kind of get some of those aha moments starting to build, and that's where you start to see the magic happening. So if you've, ha have you had team members that for whatever reason just were not comfortable with the club? I was not comfortable with the club. So how'd you get over it? Yeah, so I w I'll tell you, true story, I was 22, uh, in the, brand new to the wine business, and my car had one door that did not match all the other colors of the door, my sunroof, if you opened it, you better hope it was going to be a sunny day because it wasn't closing very easily. <laughs> I, was, I was 22 years old. I had student loans. I had my first apartment. I had, you know, a car that barely ran. I was concerned about making sure that I got to work and that I was eating something more than top ramen for dinner. And I had a bias that nobody else that I was selling to would be able to join a wine club because I couldn't join a wine club. So there was no way that I was going to be able to sell one. And somebody took me out to the parking lot, and they said, let's go have a walk. And I'm like, okay. A little nervous, but sure, let's go have a walk. And they said, what kind of cars do you see? And I'm like, well, there's a you know, Range Rover, there's a Mercedes, there's a BMW. And they're like, okay, what car is yours? And I'm like, the one over in the corner with the door that doesn't match the other cars? And they said, do you think that they can afford Wine Club? And I was like, well, yeah, I mean, they're driving an $80,000 car. And they said, right, they can join Wine Club. They can enjoy it. Ask them. And I was like, and I had that aha moment. And it was really powerful for me. And, so, and I think you can learn that in profiling your guests and actually having these conversations and engaging with open-ended questions. Where are you from? What brings you up here? You know, being, you know, what do you do for a living? You can find these things out and go, okay, this person's perfect for the case club or this person, maybe, you know, a two-bottle club is a better fit for them. Yeah. But I think that's one of the, as we obviously teach sales. It's one of the core things that wine does. And we find that one of the, if you really start peeling back the layers, if we're having someone who's stuck or not comfortable with clubs, it's often because we, and it's human nature, we want to treat others as we would want to be treated. We don't want to, if it's not in our budget or not, we're not joiners or whatever, that we don't want to bother someone else. But it's the difference between the golden rule is treating others as we would want to be treated but that's not good enough for our industry. You might remember we said this last year, it's what we're going for is the platinum rule, is we need to treat others as they would want to be treated. It has nothing to do with our preferences, our budget, our anything. It's what they want, and so, and it's really hard to figure out what they want if we're stuck in monologue mode for, for an hour. Okay, so we're gonna move on, and we will certainly um, hear more. I know we have more lessons to hear from Liz and Sonia. We're gonna move on to the exercise that we have in front of us. And there's a first step before we start, which is section one in your workbook. I would like you each to take just a couple minutes to jot down what are the metrics in regards to wine club that you personally, consistently monitor today? What are those metrics that are perhaps sales related around wine club, perhaps operations related, anything? Just please take a moment, everybody, and jot them down.
Okay, who wants to share? I can just call out a couple. Uh, <coughs> what do you What do you look at? If they bought wine on their first visit. If they bought wine on their first visit. Okay, what else? So, it, it, for, in general, how does that map to club? How does this map to club? Okay. Let's see if the buyers are engaged in the product. For looking at club success, what are you, what are you measuring? What else? Number of, Number of new memberships. What else? Attrition rate. What else? Purchase is an addition to the auto ship portion of the wine club. What else? Sorry? How many people each sales associate? So, so wine club signups by employee, by employee. That's great. What else? Tenure. Tenure. How long the members are staying? Great. So this is this is this is all good stuff. And these ladies have spent a lot of time in metrics. And I'm a metrics wonk, so they, <laughs> they put up with me. What else? What else do you guys look at? Uh, you know, I really pay attention to the number of shipments that successfully get out the door. So not the top number of club members, because I've cleaned up way too many clubs with way many, too many dead upon arrival members when I got there. So it's all about the shipments going out the door. Great. In section two in your workbooks, there's some additional ideas on club metrics, so if you want it, if you're taking notes. I look at attrition by staff member as well. So someone mentioned signups by wine club member, but also looking at attrition by uh, staff member, churn. You know, is, are they coming in under the right value proposition or are they coming in just to get the minimum number of shipments and then cancel? Or coming in because nudge, nudge, wink, wink, you get a discount today if you join the club or a wave your tasting. I also track referrals. Absolutely. Tracking referrals from existing memberships. That's great. Awesome. It's huge. You're right. Tracking quit reasons and not having 500 reasons in your database, but you know probably about five, what's controllable and what's not controllable, so that you can customize your response back to them later when you want to do rejoin campaigns. Great. What else? Um, Anything else that wasn't brought up yet? Yeah. You know, we have uh, passive versus active members. So active members and looking at really identifying and getting down into your database looking at the ones who are buying above the normal shipments, the ones who are bringing you wine club members, and putting some programming in against those guys. Yeah, ones that attend events versus the ones that attend, yeah. I like to track um, by conversion rates by club, and also um, by um, basically attrition rates by shipment, because every once in a while after one shipment in particular, you're gonna have a big spike, and you're gonna be like, why is this? Was there something wrong with the wine? Was the price too expensive? Did we you know, do something wrong in the newsletter or make people mad at us? But being able to kind of go, okay, there is a weird blip on the radar, ra in the radar. what is it? And you, you just mentioned tracking by club, and so often we don't do that, but they really do behave differently. I gave as we were sharing some of those metrics earlier. And if you're calculating your lifetime value, which is the average annual dollars you get from a club member times the tenure of the, the member, average membership in that club, it, interestingly, the higher price point clubs, the six bottle clubs, the 12 bottle clubs, they're harder to get, but they're more sticky. They stay longer. And so again, it reinforces that, wow, I really could increase perhaps member savings or definitely staff commission against those because if we're selling them right, it, it immediately pays for itself. And also with choice clubs becoming so popular, we all know it's a little bit harder to you know do our budgeting and you know projections of what wines are gonna be going, but I always go ahead and look at what percentage of my people are actually going in and changing from the default shipment. Weirdly enough, it's not always a lot, but the people who do want some flexibility are allowed to have that flexibility and I also really pay pay attention to have metrics around those guys or how I can market to them a little bit differently from the core club. Cool. Anything else? Just to back that up, I was incredibly successful with a custom choice club on a large club. Uh, so we had about 2,000 wine club members that were custom. And we, we were able to manage it so that it was very effective um, and very efficient for us to manage. But at the time, we were one of the few clubs that was able to give that choice. And it was incredibly popular. And the great news is there's so many softwares now that will allow you to do that. A lot of people have built that fun functionality in. So if you're not doing a choice club, that's one of my first things I look at implementing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and when it, but the key with that is if you have a choice club, that the default 
mm-hmm. is still something that's set. So you're not waiting for them to go in. They're not opting in. They're opting to change. Yeah, exactly. Correct. There's a default. There's the default that goes out. Another thing that's really important to track, and it took me too many years when I was back running the Ambrosia wine catalog and launched the first clubs in the industry back in 92, 93. Um, one of the first, it took me a long time to figure out that the ex-club members, those people who left us that I never actually wanted to, you know, they would just kind of piss me off. I mean, like, well, why are they leaving me? And... <laughs> I realized, because I was looking at the data, because I'm a data wonk, is like, despite them no longer being club members, they still kept buying wines from us. Mm-hmm. It's like, wow, what if I wasn't treating them like a bunch of ex-boyfriends I never want to speak to again, and actually <laughs> viewing them as alumni? You know, they've graduated from the club. Just because they've quit the club does not mean they've quit your brand. And so tracking that group your alumni group and figuring out, you know, winning isn't necessarily getting back in the club. They've already, they've already graduated. Maybe there's a new way, there's a next generation way that you can be selling them wine and keeping engagement with your brand. And I think one thing we haven't talked about yet is do you have a program available for your non-club club members? So those that are the, they aren't committers. They're not gonna put a ring on it. But they're VIPs. But they're VIPs, absolutely. And so are we, do we have programming for them when they come into the room or when we're doing special offers? Are we recognizing them? Do we have them segmented out? Do we know who they are? And are we, we giving them the love that they deserve? I, I think that's huge. I mean, I've got whales that just don't want to be in a club for whatever reason. They want to be able to pick up the phone. They want to be able to have that concierge treatment. And, uh, you know, I have certain people that I'll just designate to handle them personally and be their designated rep. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, great Repeat question. Repeat the question, please. The question is, what sort of program do, programming would we offer for them? So I would have them designated in the database, like you would traditionally a wine club. I would tag them so that I would know who they are. And I would really listen to them. So this goes back to how we were asked zero open-ended questions. Through that rapport building and through that dialogue and that relationship building, I would start to catalog either their preferences, do they like to visit on particular times, like around release times? And I would just get to know them, and then I would tailor offers to them. And it sounds like, especially when you're talking about a, a larger database, that this isn't very efficient. It can be. Even when I was with Gallo and we had large, large databases, we were able to zero in through deciling and through segmentation and really zero in on who those people were and start to group them together. And it was simple as we would have phone campaigns and downtimes in the tasting rooms. And those tasting room reps that had an affinity or a relationship with that individual, we would say, hey, it's time to reach out to them again. You've got you know, 15 minutes in the morning. Give them a call. See, see where they're at. You know, it's their favorite release is coming up. Um, or we'll have a special event, an unadvertised event, just for those types of folks. And we were able to really, really maximize those relationships. And on a personal note, we actually got to know them really well. And this is where it gets a little creepy, because when you start to have wine club members following you on Facebook, (laughs) you know, and they're like sending you birthday cards. It's, you know, I'm supposed to be sending them birthday cards. Uh, But it's, it's, we're wine. You know, we're a very social industry. I think that speaks to building relationships and that people love wine because it's, it's, it's not just a, you know, a kind of a one-off commodity. It's a relationship and it's storytelling and it's things we share with our friends. And so why not make friends with the person who sells you your wine? Yeah. Okay. Some good, good food for thought. We're going to st- now go to the next exercise. We're going to get back and keep brainstorming on cool ideas. The next exercise is on 3A. And what we're going to have you do is, co- is color the dashboard. Here's, here's the way this is set up. Okay, on Monday, next Monday, you're starting a new job as wine club manager at Leslie's Winery. Okay? Despite kind of growth that's, or continued growth in this club, you've heard that the club is having some problems, and that's why you've been hired. So you've just been given wine club metrics about the club's performance over the last three years, 
and the goals that have been set for this year, for 2017. Now let's put aside the crazy ass goals that we have for 2017 and just focus on 2016 right now. Because your first thing is to dive in and start to understand what's happening with this club. To establish your baseline, to understand what you're walking into. You have highlighters in front of you. We're going to color green for good news and obnoxious hot pink because if, for bad news. If it was red, you couldn't read it. And yellow is any question that you may have. I encourage you to color on your own and then get together with a couple people near you. You could turn around and work with people behind you, but in, in small groups of two, three, or four. And go through... Um, on 3A, there's the, the dashboard. On 3B, we actually have the questions. So, so physically jot down or highlight, what's the good news? What's the bad news? What questions do you have? And where should you, as, Les, as the new wine club manager, focus to be able to grow your club? And if anybody needs anything, just ask. More highlighters. You have about 15 minutes to do this exercise.
So two questions that are coming up. One is AOV means average order value. And second is just an implied thing you wouldn't know is we actually launched a new website at the end of 2015. Do about three more minutes. Okay, so thank you guys for participating in that. We're going to get some of your feedback and see what some of your questions are. So, you know, if I was just looking at this very top line, like some wineries might do, it's like, you know, my club's growing. I did 840000 last year and 938000 this year, and things are fine. But I've been told that they're not fine. So what, what did you find? What did you find? What is, first of all, what is the good news? Club, uh, club sales are up. Got it. What's good news? We had more people visit the tasting room. Yes, our visitors jumped from 15,000 to 25,000. That's, that's good news. I have that as green. What else is good news? Web conversion rate went up. So that new website seems to have done something positive, right? You know, the conversion rate on the web went up. Is there anything else that's good news? Club members with emails. What? Club members with emails. Club members with emails. We're getting better about collecting those emails for club members. That's great. Okay. The in, excuse me? Person reasons for dropping the club, let me see here. The percent reasons went down, which is bad actually, because beforehand I used to know 75% of the time when someone quit the club I knew why, and now I only know 50% of the time, so that would be pink. Okay, speaking of pinks, what else is bad news? What did you color pink? Yes. Yes. 
was we lost a ton of wine club members. So not only do we actually we used to lose 380 a year. Now we're lo now we lost 800 this last year. What happened? What happened? Really great question. So if you, want, if you ladies were handed this and you had no idea, you saw that, because it's not just the number of people you lost, but it's the actual attrition rate. Because remember, as your club grows, the number of people you lose is going to keep growing. That's the nature of the beast. But in this case, our attrition rate jumped from 26% up to 45%. And 26%, granted, that's normal than, than, than Oregon averages, but a lot of healthy clubs lose between 20 to 25%. Not, you know, not that big of a deal. And now it's 45, so the wheels came off somewhere to your point. What might it be? I mean, we're just making this up. You don't know anything about Leslie, but if you saw that, what are some of the things that might jump into your head? I would ask, uh, what's going on with your credit card decline rate, too? Mm-hmm. Where's our wine club manager? Yeah, where's the, oh, you mean, oh, you know, uh, he, he actually left about a, a year ago and I was trying to cut costs and didn't really, you know. Yeah. How'd that work out for you? I figured it, well, my club's, <laughs> my club's growing, so. Well, you, your revenue. But it's not healthy. <laughs> but it's not healthy, why, what else? Your revenue, your club revenue grew 12%, but your visitation grew 40%. I would expect to see some lift there. Yeah, so the fact that, and sometimes this is why, remember how we had a conversation last year about level one data, level two, level three? You know, level, if you're just stuck at that level one data looking at revenue or total club membership, you might miss the fact that the wheels have completely come off. And go ahead. And I don't know if anyone caught that there's a pretty big issue between the mailing list that we only added 20 new contacts. But somewhere in data capture, we have 5,000 new names. So I need to go find that shoebox or that drawer or maybe that recycling bin out back. Where did those names go? Because that is significant lost revenue for us. Yeah, because we could certainly be doing email campaigns and things. What, so what else jumped, at, jumped out at you guys? You know, And not only is that a good point, but, but if you were handed this and you're brand new stepping into this job, would you think those numbers were real? If they're the exact same year in, year out? Something smelling, it's something smelling funny. So that's frankly one of the questions too, is always, is always question the data and make sure you understand the source. Is it just like, oh, I think kind of sort of, we, so, we, we sold this many, you know, versus do you have systems and objective processes? Because if you can't, measure it, you can't manage it, right? You don't know what levers to pull. You know, we're assuming this is right, but you don't know what levers to pull if it's kind of garbage in, garbage out on data. But what else? Uh, yes, got one. over here, thank you. Really good point. So how do we measure the tasting room visitors? What's the best method for counting them? There's a number of methods. The most important one is be consistent, okay? Some people count glasses. I think that's a little dicey. Some people have clickers. Um, one of the best ways is to actually count it in your POS system, is to set it up that every single visitor whether they're taster or not, gets counted in the POS. So I've had a party of four, maybe there's two tasters because they were splitting, but you count the four people. It has zero, it doesn't affect your inventory, but that way it's in your data, so that way you can do the math and do the de denominator. And I, Another, like, I like to get really granular, so my daily tracking sheet that we do in the tasting room is how many people showed up, how many were club members, how many were not club members, and how many were trade. Yeah. And that way, when I'm looking at my conversion rates, I'm not looking at the total visitors coming in. I'm actually backing out people who may already be club members or may be going down a different channel. Right. Really good. Yeah, and I use the method you're talking about where I count the tasters and the non-tasters. And so I look at 
I'm capturing those, those non-tasters as well, because that's still, if you're thinking from a long-term perspective, that's still wear and tear on the facility. If you're on a, you know, a septic system that still flushes on the bodies that you've got to be thinking about, um, right? <laughs> it is. Those are, those are things that you need to be thinking about having supplies for, or things that you need to be having in your tasting room. And yeah. so I look at, it's crucial. And I also this. err on the, to that point of the counting everything. I know some winery say, oh, I just count buying units. A couple's not going to do two purchases. It's like, first of all, who are you to judge who's a couple or not, right? And, and, and second, along that thing of, op, of utilization of the facilities and how much staff you need coverage for X number of people, it's really important. And one of the things I learned from Liz years ago is the, the metrics on looking at labor hours divided by the number of visitors that they see, and then you have to have total visitors into that. There was a question or comment over here that I cut off. No, okay. On the plan, we are going to come back to this wacky plan <laughs> in a couple minutes, but thank you. <laughs> We're going to get there. Yes, in the back. Getting very few people clicking on links and emails. Ladies, what might be happening there? Something wrong with the content, something wrong with your email service provider. Uh, but you are getting open, so people are opening. That's increased. So I, that was what I was going to bring up if no one brought up. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And also, for those of you who, I hope you are, first of all, sending out different emails. There's, there's emails that are the logistics emails, like, your, hey, we're going to run your credit card and your, and your shipment's coming. But there's other emails to your club members that are relevant because of who they are with your relationship with the brand. You want to make sure, first of all, those are not just sucked up in your general emails for everyone else, that you are doing segmented email campaigns, and that you are down to the granular level, just like you were asking, looking at the opens, the clicks, the actual performance, the conversion rates on these emails by segment, and I think because they should, they should behave really differently than the rest of the world. I learned a really valuable lesson in looking at that where I kind of looked at, you know, kind of a whole year's worth of emails, and there was one that stood out, and I'm like, wow, why did this email get this huge unsubscribe kind of rate? And, you know, it was a sparkling wine house that I do some consulting with, and it was a just read Pinot based email with the Pinot release. And it was one of the biggest. I was like, okay, I'll never do that again. And so every time they call me like, our Pinots are out. We need to do a Pinot. And I'm like, great. I'm only going to send it to people who's ever bought Pinot. And that's a very small lit part of that list. Yeah. And the other, the thing that I noticed on here with the club unsubscribe rate and that jump on that. So it looks like you might have a little bit of email fatigue going on. With you, if you're, someone pointed out, you yeah, know, what we don't have rate. here is how many emails are going out. Yeah, but if you've got your click through is down to 5%, and we had a pretty healthy click through before, and then our club unsubscribe on emails is bouncing up on that, not we might the be, content. they're not liking you the mean content. My nephew did do, do a good job because we didn't have the club web manager no. here. No. Okay. no, he didn't. ROI, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ladies, did you see anything else? You know, I took a second look at this after our discussion this morning and, and sitting in um, the sessions this morning, and the club AOV started jumping the average out order value. Yeah, the yes. average order value hasn't changed in three years, but we're going to be bringing it up in 2017. So I think you were in that session and paying attention <laughs> about the sales mix and the channel mix, mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to ask you about yeah. that. Yeah. So one of the things that, um, as we talked about other th things that we look at, it wasn't on this list, but I think it's really important where we look at, at if you have different clubs at different price points, and at the end of every month, what percentage of your membership is in each club, and compare that to what percentage of the new members are joining each club, right? So if you had 12% of your members were in the 12-pack, you know, the, the full case club, but only 3% of the members coming in are in that full case club, wait a minute, that's, that means over time your AOV is gonna go down and what's going on. We had a really interesting lesson with one of our wise wineries th that uh, they actually were, are a well-known brand and, but strangely they had never had a club before, so we helped them launch a club. Well-known brand, well-respected, great guest experience. We launched a club for the first time, it was very successful and they had about 15 team members in their tasting room. And there were two guys that were inordinately successful at selling the 12-pack club. There was a three, six, and 12 option. 
And we were like, that's cool, but what are they doing and can't we teach it to the rest? And we actually, and we, everybody was struggling. They didn't even know why they were successful. It just was working that way. And finally, we sat there and we just eaves, eavesdropped. We listened in. And the difference was, and this gets back to the golden rule versus the platinum rule, judging others, saying, hey, if my budget's limited, I don't want to bother someone with a, a full case. Maybe I'll kind of sort of mention a three-pack club. You know, the only difference with these two guys is everybody else started talking about the club, saying, and here's how the club works. It, there's three bottles. It comes once a quarter. Da, 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 da. And these two guys said, here's how the club works. The best club is a full case. And then and talks about the benefits there. And then kind of, of course, if that's too much, works their way down. That was their only difference, everything they did. So again, and sometimes we stand in our own way. I've had yeah. huge success with that. Present the top club first because in your negotiation changes, yeah. right? It's not two bottles or one bottle. You're going to go from 12 to two versus two yeah. to one. And it was like Carrie brought that up. And just so if we were standing up here before, before. It's like, yeah, we were already, already talking about that. Awesome. Anything else jump out from this? You know, one thing when I'm looking at your visit of traffic going, okay, you jumped to 25, you're going to go to 25 again. You know, is 25 really the sweet spot? Do you need more staff or do you need to bring it down and go to reservation only and make them a little bit more intimate, go to seated tastings? You know, really look at that because that, you know, how you structure your tasting experience is going to change what your conversion rates are. Definitely. We've, we've led a number of wise wineries through, this, through a transition process over the, last, over the last year or so where they're saying, hey, we're going to either from open to by appointment or it used to be all bar at bar and now they're seated like there's really some change going on. And the good news is you can do that and actually plan to have less traffic. You know, you're kind of saying, I'm consciously doing this. But it's going to work out because I know my conversion rates and average order values are, are going to go up. And you could even charge more for the experience. I mean, there's lots of ways that works. But there is going to be a difference. I will stress, though, if you are going to change from kind of always being by appointment, people could drop off any time to really have a good communication plan in place. Especially have for a club good members. social media plan in place. Have a good response to Yelp and any negative in place. And then, you know, have this kind of pack up. Like, I did a splash bar at one place. So people drove out there, and we were full, and we couldn't get them in in a certain period of time. Oh, well, you know what? we got a splash bar. You're still going to get some bubbles. You're still going to get some love. And then, you know, we'll get you back another day, or you can pick up your shipment. But we did it very proactively, and we'd work through, like, every scenario from the happiest member to the most mad member. <laughs> and um, I think we, you know, we, we got a little heat a couple of times, but we were ready for it. Yeah. And I did that with a winery, too, and I enlisted the support of all the local gatekeepers. So I had the local tasting rooms, my top referrers, because I tracked referral source very closely, my top referrers, the top hotels, everybody that was sending me traffic, I made sure that they actually had the invitation to come and do the new experience and get excited about the new experience so that they were calling their referring traffic and making appointments for them. Yeah. So I'd like to kind of keep this brainstorming going. We, are, we have a gentleman down here who's concerned about the 2017 plan, and that's, that's a healthy fear. Um, and we are going to circle back to that. But let's keep the brainstorming going for a little bit of just saying, okay, what are some of these other things that you guys have done yeah. to really build relationships with the customers, to get it off with club members, to get it beyond the transactional and into those sticky brand ambassadors that, uh, that we need more of? So for me, this is having a, a comprehensive club event strategy in place, mapping it out on a calendar and looking at the mix. Do I have enough retention, you know, and a club member appreciation events? Do I have enough release and sales focused events? Do I have those that are purely social? And really defining what is the objective of that strategy? You know, do I need to, to sell wine? Do I need to really work on keeping club members happy? Do I need to work on growing club and having them bring a friend and having a very clear goal against each event or type of event? Making sure that I have various price points of events. You know, no, they're not all free, um, but no, they're not all also $125 a ticket. 
what are those mixes? Because they're going to appeal to different folks. And I think it's going to be really important that it's on your brand. There's so many great events. I've seen people that are doing, you know, a tour of every baseball stadium with their wines. And so they're getting out in the market and they're actually visiting people in all these different cities and doing a baseball game. I mean, how great is that? Or I've seen people do fly fishing weekends or I've seen people do, you know, lobster feeds or clam bakes or just make sure it works for your customer type and things that you like to do as well. And then I think you've got to build some metrics around it too so that you're tracking the success of these events. As you can see, we really like metrics because that word comes up all the time. <laughs> and you've done a lot of off-site events too. I've done a lot of off-site events. I like getting out in the market, and I think I was talking to Rob about this this morning, was that we all have members that are close to home, and you guys are all fighting for the same group of people that sit here in Portland and drive out to see you guys to make yourselves a little bit different. So if you've got people who've flown into Portland, they're driving out because you know their husband's here at the convention center in meetings all day, and they're going to go out and do some wine tasting, and they sign up for a couple of clubs, and they fly back to Texas. Well, look and see where you have little hot spots, and go out in the market meet them, have them bring some friends, work with the restaurants so that they talk to their list, they get people to come from their own mailing list, and all of a sudden you've sold more wine and you've got a whole bunch of new wine clubs. That was one of Rob, Rob McMillan's fears this morning. He said here, what, what keeps him up at night was the, that uh, the future or the current driver of our direct-to-consumer business is too localized. But we have this opportunity like Christian Miller was kind of encouraging us to like create more brand ambassadors, get this word out, and what better way than use these club members as champions in local markets to then build from there. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else on, on events? Yes, was there a question? No, okay, a hiccup, that's fine. Okay, other stuff, other, what, what do we, haven't we talked about My yet? favorite slide, all right. Um, you know, so I'm going to jump off of just kind of what we were talking about with events first. Uh, I did a really great partner pairing where I actually paired up with 12 other wineries. So we are called the Gems, and it was a Sonoma and Napa wineries. And we basically had a secret society layered under our club. So anybody who had been a club member, you know, the year prior, so this year being 2016, had spent X amount of dollars, would get this nice letter in January saying, congratulations you are now part of a very special group and you get XYZ benefits at each other winery. And it didn't mean full club benefits. It may have been like, you know, a tweaking, whatever you guys wanted to offer my club members and whatever I wanted to offer the other people club members. And we had an access page on all of our websites. And then from there, we'd actually do a once a year road show where we'd go spend four days in, you know, different cities. And so I did three different cities in Florida, and then we went to Atlanta, Georgia, and we invited all of our club members, did something in different hotels or restaurants, and it was great, because there's 12 of us, and I'm getting to see you know, her wine club member, or her wine club member, or your club member saying, oh, I've never heard of you guys, but I know Bob over there, and I buy 12 cases a year from him. And so I got all kinds of sales right there on site that I was able to go back and process when I got back to the winery. I got new club members. And people were just excited that like we showed up in their town with our other wine buddies because we know they're not drinking just our wine. And it was just a really fun experience. Yeah, really good idea to find secondary and tertiary markets that maybe don't get a lot of wine love or maybe don't have a lot of wine events or that, you know, they don't have the New York wine experience there, but maybe they have, you know, so you're in somewhere in Connecticut instead or you're, you're farther away. And it gives you a chance, city. too, if you've got kind of out for a couple of days. I did a little bit of market work in each city, too. So, you know, we kind of figured out how to make it work for us. Yeah. We're seeing that with more and more small, especially smaller wineries, that as they are kind of reconfiguring less three-tier and more focus on direct-to-consumer, sometimes the three-tier markets that they choose to keep open are driven by where they have pockets, where they have cohorts of club members. And so they know they want to go visit in the market, and so it can kind of justify that travel time to be there. You know, Liz, you were talking a little bit this morning about the success that you had with the client on trade. Can you share a little bit about oh, that? Because it yeah. was amazing metrics. Yeah, so I uh, worked with a, a winery and had access into their database, and we, we did some sorting, and we were looking at their tenure. And I, we noticed some noise when we were looking at their tenure on particular clubs. And so we dug deeper down into it, and I said, okay, if we look at just your pure consumer clubs, uh, you know, your two-bottle, your four-bottle, your six-bottle. We looked at those, and we saw that their tenure was about uh, 22 months. I sorted and segmented out trade and local industry clubs, and they mirrored all of their consumer clubs with the trade and industry club, which I thought was brilliant to begin with because we are clearly, clearly very loyal. Those tenures were 48 months 
on those industry and local trade members. So it was anybody who sold their wine out in market, so maybe a restaurateur or maybe a retailer, um, and it was also local people in the industry or who were hotel concierge or were gatekeepers. And I asked him, I was like, well, why, do you, why did you do this? You know, why do you separate them out and what are the benefits? And their reply was, there's nobody that we want more to be getting our communications and to be getting and opening our wines than people who are going to be sending us more qualified business. And the math proved that by giving them a trade discount of 30%, they overspent over the course of their lifetime value that discount that they gave them. And not only that, they were also really high referrers because they were tracking all their referral sources. So their dollars per guest average was $36. We looked at some of those club members that were in those industry and trade clubs and their dollars per guest that they were sending were up over $100. So they were sending very well qualified. So it just worked out beautifully when we did that study of their database. And this was a very small winery that we looked at. But we just, the metrics were there. They had very clean information in their database when we were able to sort through it. Yeah, was there a question? Yeah. So the question is, did the trade club have regular shipments or was it just part of a inner circle thing? In this particular one, they had, they got the exact same club schedule and club shipments. The only difference was that they got a deeper discount. They got a, a traditional 30% industry discount. Um, they already, and if you think about it, those guests who would walk into the room would pretty much generally get complimentary tastings to begin with. So they were truly in it for the love of the wine. And they, they worked that to their advantage. And it, it, nothing's more powerful than if you're at a restaurant and the, and the server says, well, I'm a member of such and such. Or you're at another winery and asking, as we did everywhere we went, where else should we go? It's like, well, actually, I'm a member over here. How powerful is that? But we tend to assume if someone's on the tray, why would they join the club? We want to join. Trust us. Yeah, keep selling. There were a few that we would have joined yesterday if we'd been asked. <laughs> you know, yeah. another really good thing that you can do, too, is if any of you guys are ever doing, because I know we all kind of cringe when we hear that maybe somebody else has made a decision to put up something on, you know, Wines so Sold Out or Ravino or Cellar Angels or Wine Spies or any one of those guys, go back and negotiate that. Okay, great. If someone orders, you know, six bottles or a case, will you send me, or you can put it in the box with it, but I had one client um, that we actually worked with, and we got the mailing address, and I sent each person a certificate, and that certificate number was their new nice number in our database, and when they came in and they redeemed their enhanced tasting, I was able to track the dollar sales that came from these people. I, in six months, got about 30 wine club members and about $80,000 through my tasting room. I mean, it was so powerful. And that was people like going, okay, great. They're going to buy our wine at a bigger discount because someone's trying to move some inventory. But I was able to actually make it a win. And I think you've done you know, very I've successfully done the same way yeah. as well. Great. Any other ideas? Any other out of the box? What haven't we talked about yet? Uh, you know, I think one that, that we constantly struggle with as an industry is what do you do when you have wine club members who send their friends in to get their comp tasting benefits? Is that an issue for anyone? Yeah. yeah. So my, my uh, policy, if you will, on that is don't manage to the policy on that. Um, I'm a, a big fan of you can't get any more qualified. Somebody has already talked up the experience and has already talked up the brand. Chances are they've probably already enjoyed a bottle of your wine at their friend's house. And so figure out what your plan is going to be and have a plan for that. You are going to have those that are going to take advantage of the situation. I mean, that's inevitable. That's going to happen. Track that. Look for them. Have a lovely sidebar conversation with those particular wine club members. But for the most part, err on the side of generous hospitality. You know, welcome them in. And, you know, we can't maybe... We'd love to have you in for a complimentary tasting today. Join the wine club, and then you can enjoy that anytime you want. And you can also get the discount, or you can get the, you know, the member savings or whatever it is. But enjoy them. Mm -hmm. So yeah, when you, what have, happens when you have a set number of free like tastings for club member and they bring twice yeah. as many people? Yeah, it happens all the time. And of course, yeah. it's only going to happen on a Saturday when at 3 o'clock. 
of a holiday yeah. weekend <laughs> when you're six deep and someone's called off sick. And the dishwasher just broke. And the dishwasher broke. <laughs> so what do you do? Err on the side of generous hospitality. You know, for today, here's what I can do for you. We can do a two for one tasting instead for, uh, you know, those that exceed the number. We can honor your four comps for everybody else. They'll, they'll get 50% off a tasting. Yeah, yeah. Or have if it's someone you haven't seen in two years because they live far away, then, you know, go ahead and do it. So, you know, I always look at those individually. I also kind of look back and go, what's the net worth of this person? Yeah, inevitably. Yeah, that can happen. Yeah, so yeah. I, I, you know, I firmly believe in the karma bank, that kind of erring on the yeah. side yeah. of the gracious yeah. we, got, we got another question down here. Yes. Yeah. Oh, you yeah. yeah. asked for the sale. Good but cre- job. <laughs> Comp four, but say, and if you guys buy, well, no problem. We'll waive, waive the rest. So you're planting that seed up front, or if you join the club, we'll waive the rest. You're planting that seed up front, and and in a way, make sure that that hurdle rate, if you will, gets them in that shopping mode. I know that when I was here four years ago, and I asked everybody in the group to raise your hand if you waived your tasting fee at one bottle, and I think almost everybody's hand went up and said, what if it was two or three? And now most of you do it for more. Gets people in the shopping mode. Yes. Always give the guests the club member discount. If they're together. If they're together. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not someone they met at the bar there. Right. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So, area on the side of Gracious, let's go over here. What's the magic number of shipments per year? I'll tell you what it's question. not. <laughs> My, the first wine club that I ever worked for had a shipment a regular traditional shipment every month of the year. Then they had it, no, 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 then it gets better. Then they had an opt-out shipment on the even months. So a total of 18 shipments a year. That is not the right number. Uh, yeah, it, yeah, 18 a year. You know, it really depends on you know, how many wines you produce, uh, you know, what your production is. I do a lot of modeling around this, and it really, there's no one-size-fits-all. What I will say is try to stay away from just once a year because it's harder to keep your credit cards up to date. So the more often you're processing credit cards, the more often you're doing that cleanup. We see pretty typical anywhere from like three to four. Yeah. Um, but really, I mean, you have to think too about your wine supply when you're looking at that and thinking long term. And so do you have wines that aren't distributed that are going to go into your club shipments? Are you creating varietals and programs that support your brand? Or do you start to go into a little bit more, you know, what we call skew creep? And now all of a sudden you have varietals that don't support your brand or that you're having to source or that are more challenging, more difficult to find. Um, Are you making things that are, you know, make sure that it supports the story and you can tell the story. But there's there's no magic number. One more question here. What happens with repeating uh, repeating a wine in a given club? Are you talking about within a year or over time? Within a year. Within a year. It's all spin, baby. Yeah. It's all spin. It's, you- it's marketing. It's how you're going to market it or put two bottles in. We love this so much. Our winemaker is just so thrilled with this wine. We're putting two bottles in this shipment mm-hmm. this time. One to drink, one to save. You know, um, or if it's the same varietal, yeah. you know, telling different stories about what it is. But I think in general, you want to have how you're communicating what is, in the, what is in the club. The good news about club is you should be planning this out years in advance, what you're slotting. And you need to from a production standpoint. And so have a plan and communicate it, and then people opt in. In the back there. How to increase additional sales at events. Which go, baby, go. We talk about this a lot. Um, so I have had events where I've had, you know, 400 people, and I've sold $500 worth of wine. I've had events where I've had 10 people, and I've sold $30,000 worth of wine. Um, so, yeah. Um, but it depends on how you seed the event and how you plan, how you 
how, what plants or what seeds you're planting. Um, so if it's a, a release event, um, you know, I want to talk about that beforehand. I want to talk about reserving your bottles, making it easy for you to be able to get your wine and go, you know, I want to, I want to do that. If it's the retention events, those for long-term members are the ones where I've sold the most. Um, but that was all about, we did a, a you know, 40 year vertical of tasting, you know, Petite Syrah one time. Um, and that was a phenomenal event. That was a very curated list. Um, a lot of those were not wine club members. A lot of those were, were non-club club members. But it was a very strategic, we knew who we wanted around the table. And we invited them to a private event with the winemaker rating his cellar. Um, and we sold a ton of wine that way. But again, it was all, it was very strategically thought out. So any other ideas for selling wine at events? I, I really think it's, you know, it's, it's emails ahead of time of, you know, there's very limited, you know, we know it'll be busy. Do you want to go ahead and just purchase now? We'll have it ready for you. So that's an easy one. I've done that one a lot. There's also posts. So, you know, thank you so much for coming to the event. We, you know, know that our lines were a little longer. Uh, it took a little longer, you know, to get some people processed. If there's anything you want, we're happy to ship it out, you know, at no shipping costs. You can kind of figure out different things that work for you. Um, and I think, you know, you brought up a point about we talk all the time. I think that make a group of friends. Go find what wineries are killing it or who's doing a really good job in this industry and create your own little forums because we've been talking at her yeah. kitchen you know, table for years now. We've come up with great ideas and we have other friends that we do this with as well. And I think this is what I love about this industry is that we collaborate. Um, we're not working against each other because if we all work together, we're going to send each other back and forth with our own wineries. And so keep working together and figure out what's working and share those, those wins. So I'd like to take a minute and close the loop and talk about our two sab wacky, wacky 2017 plan. So go back to 3A in your workbook. This plan, and these guys, when I, when I put this out, they're like, oh, you're just like every CIO, CEO I know. <laughs> like, you're like, you want us to double the club volume in a year? What are you smoking? Uh, Share so, it. <laughs> and I don't recommend that you have a plan that you're doubling club volume in a year. But humor me just for a second, and let's walk through it, OK? We saw that in 2016, the top line was healthy, the club was growing, but there was a lot of structural problems underneath. Some we don't know why, we're just only guessing. But like Deborah pointed out in her, in her presentation this morning on sustainable businesses, we want to benchmark ourselves against those who are really kicking it out of the park, right? And so if we take a look at, um, if we, t we assume that our high tasting room visitor account sticks and we assume that we staff appropriately against it so we're optimizing the time there, we assume that we actually are training our team members and they care about selling club, we don't end up with zero mentions, but it's actually part of their natural course of bringing up and we're have incentive compensation that's really meaningful for them. It can actually, she can get a new car, you know, based on club membership, so she's selling for a year. <laughs> and so we're correcting some of those structural things. A 7%, I mean, I know on average, it's lower here in Oregon. With the wise wineries we work with, they often start out in the 2 3 4% zone. And we get them in the 7, 8, 9, 10% zone for tasting bar signups. It can be done. So it's just not out of whack. It can happen. Um, from a data capture rate, I mean, it's important. We, we tend to have a club or bust mentality in this industry. You walk in, and I'm going to sell you up for a club membership, and maybe I'm successful four to seven percent of the time. Well, what happens with the other 93 percent of the people who came to visit us? And hopefully they had a rocking good time and we haven't invited them to stay in touch. Okay, we need to get better at that contact data capture and we find as an industry, and again, we had zero, zero, zero people. We saw the little cards sign up, but it wasn't part of anyone's patter inviting us of why we want to stay in touch. Yes. And it's so important to attach that first order to that customer yes. data. I audit every, every time I see a tasting room customer pick up and it's a $500 order and there's no name I'm like going down there I'm like hey John why didn't you do this okay. uh, I need this info and again years ago we used to not pay for club for uh, pay our team members for club member signups and then we started and guess what clubs grew well guess what a lot of wineries are doing now they're also paying people for email data capture it's not the same rate you know it's a buck here a buck there absolutely meaningful what we find 
is that wineries usually are less than 10% on data capture or over 60%. They are rarely in between. So it's kind of culturally, did they find a way graciously to say, hey, you know, they're engaged, they're figuring out what, what turns this guest on, and great, you've got, you know, please sign up for email list so we can tell you about our upcoming events, so we can let you know when we come to your market, things like that. So again, can we do this all in a year on all these factors? No, but I'm just showing you how the, how the math adds up. So if you were doing things at best of class industry practices, what could happen? So we could increase data capture to 60%. We, we've done that with 47 wineries I can think of. You know, mm -hmm. it can work. Um, that website, I think someone uh, b before said, yes, we have a new website, so our conversion rate actually for club members increased, but whoops, we forgot to reattach it to all of our, all of our search engine optimization. So we've gotten 50,000 website visitors in the past. We could do that again and maintain that conversion rate, so that's possible. Our attrition rate historically has been in that you know, 20, 25, 24, 25% zone. That's possible if we get back there. We have to figure out what the heck was going on, you know, but now we have you guys as the superstar club manager on board and we'll figure that out. Because we know that if it's being sold properly and we're tracking that attrition down to the individual, not only who's signing people up, but who, who's signing people up inappropriately. You know, people respect what we inspect. And we had that, that lesson from last year. I, I hope that you take away from this session at least some new ideas. I hope that, um, you know, Carrie asked the question when we started out, how many people are tracking their response rates and really know at least some of these basic levels. It's a really important discipline, not only for you, but for your team members. Teaching them to even track their own response rates. I saw 20 people today, how many did I sign up? It's a sense of pride. You know, people want to do a good job and they want to know what winning is looking like. And so if we can get alignment, you know, really in what's motivating them and find ways to celebrate, I know that we're going to move the needle on club. So with that, thank you guys very, very much. <laughs>